good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Irfan Nuruddin. I'm a professor here in the School of Foreign Service at Georgetown and director of the Georgetown India Initiative. And on behalf of the many faculty and students who are part of the India Initiative, it is my honor to welcome you to campus. This is a bioethics research library. It's one of my favorite spaces here on campus during the day. For those of you who haven't been here before, it's a functioning library. Students sitting here pretending to do their homework. <laughs> Uh, no, actually studying quite hard. I think if you come to this library, you're here to actually get some work done. Uh, but in the evenings, we sometimes can convert it into an event space. And over the years, I've had the honor of hosting a great many luminaries from India over here. But there's probably none that we've done that has quite the resonance and the significance of tonight's uh, speaker. It's a wonderful, incredible honor to have you over here. Uh, it is commonplace in such things to start by saying that the speaker needs no introduction and then to give a long introduction. So instead, I'm actually going to stick to my words. So uh, we have with us this evening someone who does not need uh, a long introduction, but deserves at least a short one. Uh, Professor Raj Mohan Gandhi has established himself as one of the foremost historians of contemporary uh, India, but in especially his willingness to engage some of the most pertinent and burning issues of the future of the idea of India uh, today uh, is particularly welcome at a point, at a time where it often feels like voices of liberalism, of progressivism, and a challenge to sort of a, a different version of uh, India is being advanced back home without much opposition. So uh, in the 150th anniversary, the birth month of the Mahatma, uh, Professor Gandhi's grandfather, it is really significant to have him here with us to speak on the topic of Hindu nationalism in Gandhi's India. What we're going to do is have him have the podium. We're here to listen to him and to learn from him. So we'll have him have the podium to speak uh, to us, after which I will have the privilege of engaging him uh, in conversation from uh, these, the seats behind me. But we want to make sure that there is time left uh, for you to ask your questions of him. I should say that this is on the record in the sense that we're we are making a video of this event that, so that we can make it available to the many people, uh, both in India and in America and elsewhere, who would be keen to hear the remarks today but couldn't join us in person. So please be aware of that fact. And with that, let me also remind you to turn your cell phones off uh, to confirm that they are off if you haven't had done so already. I want to thank uh, Brahmachari uh, Sharan, uh, who's uh, uh, incredible partner here in, at Georgetown for bringing to us this opportunity when contacted by his colleagues, uh, Sunita Vishwanath and Amtiazuddin, uh, who have made possible through their sponsorship uh, Professor Gandhi's visit to Washington and to Georgetown today. I should say that just yesterday evening, he was speaking at Berkeley. That's a few thousand miles away from Washington. So it speaks to his uh, fortitude that he's made the cross-country journey and will be joining us this evening. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Professor Rajmohan Gandhi. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Irfan, and uh, Professor Irfan. And thanks to everyone for coming uh, this evening. I appreciate that very much. Um, so at, at Berkeley, they were willing to listen to me for 50 minutes. Uh, so I have my notes. So when I approach 30 minutes, whether or not I have made any conclusion or made any sensible point, please stop me. Because I'm very keen that we'll have a conversation. That's the main purpose. Now, uh, of course, I thank all those who've made possible this chance for me to interact with all of you. And I thank you, all of you, again for coming. Um, from the end of World War II until recent years, many in the world across national, racial, religious, ethnic divides shared a common dream. That dream nursed in the US, in India, South Africa, Latin America, Europe, elsewhere, included equality for all, dignity for all, protection of all, mutual respect, mutual friendship. It was a dream to be achieved through democratic participation, the rule of law, and where necessary through nonviolent struggle. It was not actualized anywhere, this dream, but it was celebrated everywhere. In recent years, an alternative vision has questioned and in many places replaced that dream. 
This alternative vision seems to take pleasure and pride in hierarchy, domination, money power, gun power, coarse language. It elevates hate over friendship, supremacy over equality, double speak over honesty, guns over lives. This vision has champions, in many eyes heroes. In several countries, this vision has won elections, installed governments, and replaced constitutions. When not many days back at the Houston event called Howdy Modi, where Modi in effect endorsed Trump for 2020, and Trump suggested that Modi was the father of India, we saw the mutual adoration of ethno-nationalists. It is not hard to imagine a larger jamboree somewhere, where these two are joined by Putin, Xi Jinping, Turkey's Erdogan, Brazil's Bolsonaro, by the way, Turkey's Erdogan, and Trump also in the last few days have expressed their limitless admiration for each other. Brazil's Bolsonaro, Hungary's Orban, Britain's Boris, not everyone sharing all the same views, all of them praising one another and receiving standing ovations. Now, <clears throat> one of India's sharpest cartoonists is E.P. Unni, who draws for the Indian Express. Uh, 19 years ago, on December 12, 2000, the Indian Express carried an Unni cartoon showing Sudarshan, then chief of the RSS, as a school teacher. In this cartoon, uh, there is Sudarshan, and before Sudarshan sits squatting on the floor, Vajpayee, then the Prime Minister of India, who's, who is a school student wearing a school uniform of a shirt and shorts. And, uh, and Vajpayee's pupil in this cartoon asks Sudarshan, the teacher, tell me Sudarshan ji, what happened when Godse ji went to the prayer meeting to protect Gandhi ji? Uh, four years after this cartoon appeared, uh, the editor-in-chief of Express at the time, Shekhar Gupta, and this is from his account, written in 2012, before the BJP came to power for 2014. Gupta was invited to dinner by Sudarshan, the RSS chief, who told him that while Godse had indeed gone with a pistol to Gandhi's prayer meeting, he had not pulled the trigger. Someone else killed Gandhi, said Sudarshan, adding ominously that the man benefiting from the assassination was Jawaharlal Nehru, Gandhi's close colleague and India's first prime minister. As Bob Dylan wrote, the times, they are changing. <laughs> and they've changed some more after Unni drew his cartoon in the year 2000. And after Gupta told the Sudarshan story in the year 2012. In some eyes, or many eyes, Godse no longer needs exculpation. He deserves praise. Um, now, I said the times are changing. But Gandhi still remains in many quarters um, quite a figure. And it's deem, it seems uh, that denouncing Gandhi is risky at times. So double speak is safe. And uh, here I must read uh, a Hindi Urdu uh, poem that uh, Hussain Haidari has composed. And I, he, I have his permission to read it. And then I will also read the English translation. Khaki rang divaron par latakti Gandhi ji ki badi si photo ke piche se dupehri mein ek lambi bhuri si chipkali nikalti hai. Reng kar khamoshi se ird gird photo ke gasht ye lagati hai aur jaise hi koi keet patanga urkar paas se guzarta hai dhar daboch leti hai, pankh noch deti hai, maas chaba jati hai, zinda nigal jati hai aur phir bade salike se jaise kuch hua na ho, koi bhi mara na ho, rengti hui vapas Gandhi ji ke photo ke piche lot jati hai. Translation by uh, Jyoti Bachani, and with her permission, I'm reading English translation of, and she translates, I think, quite appropriately, Chipkali in this case, as chameleon. Khaki colored wall with a large photo of Gandhiji, from behind which at midday, a large brown chameleon crawls out. Quietly, it surveys here and there near the photo for any moth or mosquito flying by to snap off its head, peel off its wings, devour its flesh, swallow it alive, then smartly, as if nothing has happened, no one has died, it sneaks back behind the picture of Gandhiji. Uh, <clears throat> now, many here will know that Hindu nationalism owes a good deal to the revo revolutionary and poet from Maharashtra Vinayak Namodar Savarkar. Uh, Savarkar declared well before Jinnah made a similar statement that Hindus and Muslims were two nations. Following Savarkar's lead, 
Hindu nationalist literature defines good Indians as those to whom India is both homeland and holy land, a criterion that makes India's Muslims and Christians unpatriotic by definition. In the U.S., this definition would make Indian Americans unpatriotic as also America's Jews, Muslims, Sikhs, and Christians. Hindu nationalism's ideological and cultural arm, we all know, is the RSS. It is one of the world's most powerful organizations today. Its cadres successfully placed in India's central, state, and local governments, bureaucracy, universities, the media, other institutions. Affiliated bodies take the RSS ideology to youth, to students, women, trade unions, Dalits, Adivasis, merchants associations, people of Indian origin across the world. The BJP proudly acknowledges its relationship with the RSS. Prime Minister Narendra Modi was an RSS activist before emerging as a political leader. For Hindu nationalists, Indian is synonymous with Hindu. Uh, and Muslim is synonymous with enemy. Uh, a man called B. N. Jog, in 1994, wrote a book about uh, the threat of Islam, and he is one of the advocates of Hindu nationalism. And in, this, in that book he wrote uh, about Spain, and according to him, in Spain, converted Muslims were given the option either to return to their original fold of Christianity or death or expulsion from Spain. This is the way they found most appropriate to deal with Islam. That is what Jog uh, claims. By contrast, he lamented, in India, nobody even thought on the lines of Spain. The resultant effect is there for everyone to see. Hindus never thought of bringing back converted Muslims to their original Hindu fold. This serious lacuna resulted in keeping Islam alive. So this was his complaint. Uh, Christians, too, followers of another foreign religion, uh, must become Hindus if they want acceptance as Indians. And uh, as many here know, there is an Article 30 of the Indian Constitution, which uh, grants the right to religious and linguistic minorities to form and run educational institutions. This article has been an eyesore for Hindu nationalists for a long time. And uh, we could expect that this Article 2 will attract the attention of the present regime. Now, we all know that Gandhi's vision for India and his Hinduism clashed fundamentally with Hindu nationalism. I'd like to say here an obvious statement that not only is Indian democracy in very great danger today, Hinduism is in very great danger today. Uh, Gandhi's vision for India and his Hinduism clashed fundamentally with Hindu nationalism. His ideals of nonviolence, forgiveness, equality, which he located firmly in the Hindu tradition, were at odds with the advocacy of Hindu primacy. Hindu extremists made several attempts on Gandhi's life before the final and successful one on 30th January. The penultimate bid was made on 20th January. And what Gandhi said after that attempt is, I thought I might uh, relate. So the day after the, the attempt, uh, when one man was uh, arrested. He had detonated a, a, a small bomb, and, but the others had slipped away. They had planned to shoot into Gandhi at that stage, but they, there was a miscarriage, and then they left to come back later. And the man who was arrested, Malan Lal Pawa, told the police that God had wanted him to destroy Gandhi, who was Hinduism's enemy. So this is what Gandhi said the next day. You should not have any kind of hate against Madan Lal. He had taken it for granted that I am an enemy of Hinduism. Is it not said in chapter 4 of the Gita that whenever the wicked become too powerful and harm dharma, God sends someone to destroy them? The man who exploded the bomb obviously thinks that he has been sent by God to destroy me. Continues Gandhi, but if we do not like a man, does it mean that he is wicked? If someone kills me, taking me for a wicked man, won't he have to answer before God? When he says he was doing the bidding of God, he is only making God an accomplice in a wicked deed. Those who are behind him, those whose tool he is, should know that this sort of thing will not save Hinduism. If Hinduism is to be saved, it will be saved through such work as I am doing. 
uh, some Sikhs came to me and asked me if I suspected the Sikh was implicated in the deed. I know he was not a Sikh, but what even if he was? What does it matter if he was a Hindu or a Muslim? May God bless him with good sense. So nine days after saying this, Gandhi was killed. Now we know that Gandhi, from very early days, from his Hind Swaraj, which was written when he was 40, written in 1909, he said India cannot cease to be one nation because people belonging to different religions live in it. Uh, in no part of the world are one nationality and one religion synonymous terms, nor has it ever been so in India. This, of course, is what the Hindu nationalists frontally challenge. Gandhi goes on to ask, is the God of the Muslim different from the God of the Hindu? There are deadly proverbs in India as between the followers of Shiva and those of Vishnu, yet nobody suggests that these two do not belong to the same nation. Another core view of Gandhi was about the Almighty. Human beings called God by different names. God, Jehovah, Ishwar, Allah, Khuda, Ek, Onkar, Ram, Rahim, Karim, Krishna. But all Gandhi thought were addressing the same supreme being. As the line he sung and millions of Indians sung, Ishwar, Allah, Terena. Though composed long before his times, the line became synonymous with Gandhi. In April of the year 2000, when I happened to be in Bangladesh and went to the area called Noakhali, where Gandhi had been 54 years previously, and I met people, I bumped into people and I asked them, do you know anything about Gandhi? Two or three persons instinctively responded to my question by singing Ishwar Allah Terena. So the Rama whom I adore, Gandhi explained in one of his, the Noakali villages, Sathur Khil, as he had explained elsewhere, the Rama whom I adore is God himself, different from any historical Rama. He always was, is now, and will be forever a God who was unborn and uncreated. Of course, for the Hindu nationalists, Rama is, was born in a particular place. They don't say when, 10,000 years ago, 500,000 years ago, but they're sure of the place where he was born, uh, but not for Gandhi. Uh, <clears throat> it's worth noting that uh, studying the discourse of Hindu nationalists, whether it's a written discourse, spoken discourse, it's very seldom includes any prayer to the Almighty. For them, Mother India to be more specific, a map of Mother India is the source of strength, the reason for sacrifice, the object of worship. For Gandhi, God was the source of strength, of solace, of perspective. While India was a land for everyone, a land served and built by everyone, including by Muslims, including by Christians, and also a nation with a purpose. Now, people speak of Gandhi's role in India's independence. <coughs> And that is a well-understood, well-acknowledged uh, fact of history. Uh, what is less acknowledged, less recognized, is that had it not been for Gandhi's efforts in the last two years of his life, uh, India might not have become a nation for all, with fundamental rights, with uh, equal protection for everyone. And uh, so Gandhi fought very, very hard indeed at that time and successfully. Uh, his interventions at critical meetings of the Indian National Congress ensured that Free India would be launched politically and constitutionally as a nation for everyone, with equal protection for all. At that time, Pakistan, just formed as, quote unquote, a Muslim homeland, was echoing with demands to be declared an Islamic state. Many in India responded with cries for a Hindu counterpart. India's capital city, Delhi, teemed with hundreds of thousands of Sikh and Hindu refugees from Western Punjab. Newly free India could easily have been launched as a Hindu state. That did not happen. Gandhi's focused effort, backed by Prime Minister Nehru, but also by Deputy Prime Minister Patel, laid the foundation for a secular India with room in it for people of any or no faith. From today's vantage point, in my understanding, this feat appears to be every bit as remarkable as independence from alien rule. And soon, as we all know, this feat was entrenched in the Constitution that Dr. Ambedkar, son of so-called untouchables, would architect. It's a different story <coughs> in India today. Now, some in today's India say that a second-generation Indian-American 
should of course be running for the President of the United States. Yet in India, Muslims whose forebears may have arrived in India 1,000 years ago must prove their loyalty to the Indian state before they can be allowed to vote. In the election campaign of April, May this year, <coughs> Giriraj Singh, a union minister, BJP candidate from Begu Sarai in Bihar, referred to the popular cry, Vande Mataram, which Hindu nationalists often ask Muslims to raise as proof of their loyalty to India. Pointing out that as Hindus, his deceased relatives were cremated, they did not need graves, Giriraj Singh reminded Muslims, you will need three arm lengths for your burial. And then he said, those who cannot say Vande Mataram, the nation will never forgive them. After his and his party's large electoral victory, Giriraj Singh was promoted to full cabinet rank. It was one of several indications that a democratic India that treats all as equal citizens is disappearing before our eyes. Now, <clears throat> I'll just give two or three examples. You are aware of, of many of these, but I think it's worth recognizing precisely what happens. On April 1, 2017, the dairy farmer, very humble farmer, Pehlu Khan, was lynched. Um, and there was a trial. And then, uh, on August 14 this year, a verdict was given that uh, all the men accused were acquitted. There was triumphalist sloganeering of the supporters of the accused, and there was despair in the family of Pehlu Khan. Jabuna Begum Khan's widow said she was heartbroken. Ishad Khan, his oldest son, said, we've lost faith in the law. Um, and as Harsh Mandar, the man who resigned from the Indian Administrative Service after 2002, when the Gujarat killings had taken place, uh, who's been trying to assist uh, those, the families of people who are killed like this, he writes, this was an acquittal foretold. From the day of the attack, the police did everything they could to subvert the possibility of any punishment of the men who planned or executed before video cameras the public lynching of Pehlu Khan. Now, Pehlu Khan had listed six men in his statement before he died, in his dying statement. The police removed the names of all these six men from the list of the accused. Two videos had been taken of the crime, but the police did not send the video for forensic verification. Citing the absence of verification, the court rejected the videos as evidence. Months after the lynching, uh, reporters of the TV channel NDTV captured on secret camera the main accused bragging, we kept beating him for one and a half hours. First there were 10 people, then the crowd swelled. But this video was not presented to the police, by the police to the court. The case was designed to fall apart. Not only that, a month before the acquittal, Pehlu Khan's sons and nephews were charged sheeted for transporting milch animals allegedly across state borders without required documents. In fact, they had not crossed any state border when they were attacked. As Harsh Mandar puts it, the rules of crime and punishment are being rewritten in an India rapidly remolded as a Hindu nation. By these new rules, if anyone is lynched for allegedly harming the cow, the persons lynched are considered the original sinners, after all, they sought to injure or kill the cow sacred to Hindus. The lynch mob are the victims. They were provoked by the alleged cow killers. Their violence is righteous and heroic. The cow killing communities, as they are labeled, are the enemies. The lynch mobs are the soldiers of the Hindu nation. In dozens of well-publicized trials in the last two years, the accused have all been acquitted. And perhaps you have heard of Sudha Bharadwaj, she was born an American citizen to Konkani Brahmin parents. They were pursuing their PhDs at MIT here. Bharadwaj returned to India at the age of 11. She gave up her US citizenship at the age of 18. She joined IIT Kanpur to study mathematics. Then she studied law, became a lawyer. She worked with the uh, Chhattisgarh Mukti Morcha, fought against corrupt bureaucrats to ensure that legal wages were paid to workers in mines and plants located in Bhilai in Bihar. She 
fought for Dalit rights, tribal rights to land, education, health, security. She became a visiting professor at the National Law University. In September 2018, over a year ago, along with five others, Sudha Bharadwaj was arrested uh, on the charge of wanting to initiate a Maoist attack. She was arrested in the city of Pune. Uh, she's been in jail since then. She has not been brought to trial. Her lawyer has told uh, a high court judge that the police had relied on six documents, most of them typed letters and some of them naming her to build their case against her. None of the letters was written by her or addressed to her or even found in her possession. Yet she and the others arrested remained in prison without being brought to trial. Then there is Justice Akil Abdul Hamid Qureshi. For some time, he was the senior most judge in the Gujarat High Court. In 2010, as a High Court judge, he had sent Amit Shah, the BJP's national president, to police custody in the Sarabuddin fake encounter case. In May this year, the Collegium of the Indian Supreme Court recommended that Qureshi be appointed Chief Justice of the High Court of Madhya Pradesh, one of India's largest states. But then the government intervened, and the Supreme Court then said, all right, we will not send him to Madhya Pradesh High Court. We will send him as the Chief Justice to Tripura High Court, which is a, Tripura is a small state in northeastern India. Um, and Justice Qureshi has resigned from the judicial service. So this is what the Supreme Court, too, does. Now, Kashmir, uh, I've spoken about it in other places, too, and all of you are aware of it. But I will say one or two things. The Article 370 that has been removed. It was a fig leaf, yes, but it was an important fig leaf. In many eyes, it validated, legitimized India's suzerainty over Kashmir. Now, without Article 370, Kashmiris only see India forcibly occupying their land through probably half a million soldiers in the Kashmir Valley, which has seven or eight million people. The Indian government does not give any figure of how many soldiers it has in Kashmir. But Kashmir perhaps provides the world's highest soldier to resident ratio. And we know, all of you know, Kashmir has been silenced, curfews, total bans on meetings, total bans on any discussion of recent events, on pain of imprisonment and on he heavy fine. And uh, Ram Madhav, one of the BJP's leaders, whose Kashmir is his portfolio, was the other day in Srinagar, and two days back, the, some of the Indian media carried this statement from him in Srinagar. Of course, he held a meeting of some BJP politicians. No public meetings are allowed. Others can't meet. No assembly is allowed. No discussion is allowed. Silence is the rule. Ram Mahathir said at this meeting, anyone who creates hurdles on the path of peace or development will be dealt with sternly. There are many jails in India for these. Then he added, everyone is afraid of Bodhiji. Unquote. A PTI story. I won't... Uh, there's no time to discuss the National Register for, of Citizens, very important move that is being made. It has been tried in the state of Assam, and there's, a, there's an announcement, a threat, that they will enforce this in other parts of India. In effect, this is a bid to make Indian Muslims second-class, insecure citizens dependent on the government's mercies. And the idea is that everyone has to prove the poorest person uh, in the most difficult circumstances, must produce some certificates about parents, grandparents, that they were actually citizens to make sure that a Muslim living in India is not an infiltrator or an illegal immigrant from other parts of, 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 of neighboring countries. So the, the, the idea is to detect so-called illegal immigrants or infiltrators, as they're called, to delete their names from electoral rolls, and to deport and detain them. Uh, and then there is Ayodhya. In a few days, the Supreme Court is going to talk about Ayodhya. Now, let me offer some concluding points. 
When toxicity hit the subcontinent in 47, Gandhi, Nehru, Patel intervened with clear and firm voices. And India limped back to sanity and began what became an impressive march for 50 to 60 years. Today, when mobs, coerce, and officers of the state side with the coercers, Prime Minister Narendra Modi remains silent. I don't think the men and women of India on India's streets are bad people or hate-filled people. They're not. Yes, they are excited by rumor. They're excited by anger. They're excited by uh, what appears on television. They're apt to join a crowd, at times even a violent crowd. But they heed a firm functionary of the state. And functionaries usually heed the line drawn by a respected or admired leader. Narendra Modi is an admired leader in today's India. He's a greatly admired leader by large sections. His silence before intimidation, before cruelty, before lynching, will define Narendra Modi in history. Now, you would not get that impression if you read Modi's article published in October 2 in the New York Times. The article concluded with these lines. Let us work shoulder to shoulder to make our world prosperous and free from hate, violence, and suffering. That is when we will fulfill Mahatma Gandhi's dream, summed up in his favorite hymn, Vaishnava Janato, which says that a true human is one who feels the pain of others, removes misery, and is never arrogant. His last line is, the world bows to you, beloved Bapu. Some days after the New York Times article was published, Mr. Modi, who was electioneering in Maharashtra, indicated, more or less announced, that India's highest honor, the Bharat Ratna, would be posthumously awarded to Savarkar. Five months before Gandhi's assassination, in August 47, Godse and one of his accomplices had flown with Savarkar from Bombay to Delhi and back. And in January 48, the month when Gandhi was killed, Godse and this accomplice, Apte, had two meetings with Savarkar. On January 30, when Godse stepped up to within three or four feet of Gandhi, who with his arms resting on Abha and Manu was walking to his prayer platform, Godse bowed a little before he pulled out his pistol and fired. Accused of a role in the Gandhi assassination, Savarkar was acquitted for want of corroboration. Although on February 27, 1948, four weeks after this assassination, Patel had written to Nehru of his conclusion, based on what he called his almost daily touch with the progress of the investigation into the killing, that, quote, it was a fanatical wing of the Hindu Mahasabha directly under Savarkar that hatched the conspiracy and saw it through. A commission of inquiry appointed by the government of India in 1966 headed by retired Chief Justice Jivan Lal Kapoor, after a three-year inquiry, held that Savarkar was in on the conspiracy. Now, if the project of Hindu nationalism continues its present advance, some of its champions may not hesitate in times to come to assert that Savarkar was indeed involved in Gandhi's assassination. When the time is ripe, doublespeak can be abandoned. So let me make two or three points in con conclusion. One, very few in the world are purely one thing. There is likely an element, large or small, of Hindu nationalism in Hindu admirers of Gandhi. It is possible that there are elements of Gandhi's Hinduism and of traditional Hinduism in Hindu nationalists also. Secondly, a great many in India, many more than we think, are responding in ways they can to Hindu nationalism's dangers and errors. This is very important to recognize. We don't learn of it all the time, but it is happening in every part of India. Of course, one absolutely outstanding example is this TV journalist, Ravish Kumar. But, and, and those who know about him know, know of his incredible courage and his uh, diligence. But there are so many others also. Um, and there is great courage, great ingenuity in these responses. And of course, this is true for responses elsewhere to nationalisms, ethno-nationalisms in other countries. Thirdly, those of us who are troubled by the surge of nationalism, 
may need to be a little nicer than we are to our allies in the battle. That an ally must agree with us on every single point is a foolish demand, a recipe for failure in the battle. We come to this moment of concern, of crisis, from different places. Let us make allowances for one another. Let us appreciate one another. Nationalism surge will end. In my, in my own lifetime, I've seen the departures of imperialism, apartheid, Hitler, Stalin, Pol Pot. Oppressions will end, liberty and equality will again be honored. But when, we do not know. Uh, when there was Hitler, when there was Stalin, there was the United States uh, willing to, to fight it. Today, when there is this surge of ethno-nationalism in many parts of the world, can we think of major countries, major powers that are determined to fight this? Uh, we can't. So uh, history does not offer a clear roadmap on how we will get out of this situation. But uh, this is my humble suggestion. As one of Gandhi's favorite lines puts it, we should not demand, quote, to see the distant scene. One step enough for me. No matter how small or simple, it is the next step that you and I should be searching for. Local steps will make a global impact eventually. Find the next step, the rest will follow. Including in the end, the dream will be restored. And I will just say one more thing, just to amplify this last point. This is true of India and of the United States, and I imagine true of other parts of the world too. Those of us who are deeply concerned or deeply unhappy, and we have our own group, say, our own, we have the Indian Americans, uh, we cannot fight this battle on our own. The Indian Americans must really get to know the African Americans. The Indian Americans must get to know the Latin and Latin Americans. The Indian Americans, and, and not in a superficial way, proximity is available in the United States. We are all next to one another, but proximity does not always lead to knowledge. But it is when, and this is especially true of if I may say so, us from in, connected with India. Um, we speak of Martin Luther King Jr. and many other African American leaders who were inspired by Gandhi. But how many of us have really, really, really entered into the history, the lives of our African American brothers and sisters? Uh, this is just one example. But if and this is true of India too. Uh, we have got to figure out ways of deepening our solidarity with our brothers and sisters of different backgrounds. So I'll, I'll stop there and I thank you again. Thank you. So I have a few questions uh, for you to get this conversation started and then we'll open it up. Uh, I should say, I mean, we have both a mix of people who have undoubtedly been following your writings and your speeches for a number of years, but I'm also very pleased to see so many students uh, in the room who are probably maybe hearing from you for the very first time. And so a tremendous uh, opportunity for them, as it is for me, uh, to be both uh, exposed to your thinking, but also through you, of course, to uh, your illustrious grandfathers, <laughs> both your grandfathers, uh, with such remarkable contributions to, uh, to India and the country that uh, so many of us call home. I want to start with maybe asking you to amplify on a couple of points. The first is, you refer to uh, the challenge to Hinduism, and with that, maybe I want to push a little bit on whether we cede too much ground when we refer to the project of the current 
uh, right wing as creating a Hindu India, when in fact one might argue that the India that they have, that they wish to create has very little to do with Hinduism whatsoever. So, and so to the extent that language matters, how should we think about this project? Is this about creating a Hindu India? Is this actually Hindu nationalism? Or is the mere you know, concatenation of those words itself doing violence to your understanding of Hinduism uh, as a way of then give, giving us a vocabulary against which to push back, so. Yeah, absolutely, we must not see the wonderful word Hindu, absolutely not. But Hindu nationalism is a precise concept. It's a precise concept and I think we must understand it and we must uh, defeat it, counter it. Um, Can I have you? Oh, I beg your pardon. Okay. Okay. Am I heard? Yes. So, yes, to repeat, uh, that uh, we must not cede the word, the term, the thought, the concept, the wonderful concept of, of Hinduism. Uh, Hindu nationalism, on the other hand, is a precise ideology, a precise political movement, a precise cultural movement, uh, in my opinion, a, a very strong anti-democratic movement against equality, against mutual respect, against mutual friendship. So that, uh, we, that must be opposed. Uh, and also, I think, while stoutly defending and, and enriching, if we can, and re recovering the greatness of the word Hinduism, uh, we must also hold the Hindu nationalists to task and to be precise, you know, because the, 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 I mentioned doublespeak. Uh, the RSS and, and the BJP also, again and again, again and again, uh, they say, what is Hindu? A Hindu is anyone who lives in India. What is Hindu? Hindu is a follower of Hinduism. We must ask them to be absolutely clear. What do they mean? They must end their double speak. If by Hindu they mean an adherent of, a member of the Hindu religious community, it's one thing. But if they insist that a Muslim is also a Hindu because he's an Indian, a Christian is also a Hindu, that double speak must end. Thank you. Okay, a second question that I want to push a little bit. You uh, suggested that for six or seven decades post-independence, we have a particular trajectory, and then think of 2014 as a particular break in that trajectory. Uh, some might suggest, and I, I'll put myself in this camp, that that's an overly, overly generous interpretation of the pre-2014 record of independent India, that in fact, uh, Hindu-Muslim violence did not start with 2002, that anti-minority violence, so you think of the 1984 pogrom against Sikhs in Delhi and North India and across India, that in fact, the failure of India's institutions, the courts, the media, to hold government accountable had set in well before uh, 2014. Right, had said in well before this current moment. Uh, would you agree? Would you? How would you respond to the? This is not a whataboutism. This is not a you know. This isn't bad because what about that? But trying to diagnose why it is that we are in a particular moment where the courts will acquit the accusers of Pelukan, where the police will sabotage a case, and suggesting that maybe this is not just entirely that the problems won't end when Modi ji is no longer. Prime Minister, but in fact that the public institutions of the country have been innovated such that they can't hold our leaders of any political party accountable in the way that democracy demands. Well, thank you for a very important point, and I, broadly speaking, you're absolutely right. That to imagine that there was a sudden and abrupt change in 2014 would be in some ways incorrect. Uh, and as I mentioned, that uh, the norm was there, it was not actualized. But when these grave and serious exceptions to the norm occurred, and they did occur, of course, 1984 was a terrible example. And in 1969, the 100th year of Gandhi's birth, there were terrible killings in Ahmedabad, Gujarat, many parts of India. And Bacha Khan, when he came to India, he spoke to the Indian parliament and he said, what are you talking about Gandhi? But see what's happening all across India. So terrible things indeed. But then Bacha Khan could speak to the Indian parliament and speak like that. And Indian newspapers wrote about it. All of us were involved 
in 1984 against the horrible things that happened. It was discussed on radio, on television. But today, no. I speak in Georgetown about it. But how many in India are speaking about it, are able to speak about it? How many in Kashmir are able to even breathe about it? So that is the sea change that has taken place. And the system, well, I've not had the time today to go into what's happening in the universities, what's happening to textbooks, what's happening on TV channels. Uh, you, you know the Jawala Nehru University is this eminent university, postgraduate university in humanities and social sciences. Not so long ago, a minister of the government of India said that the way to teach patriotism to the students of JNU is to install a tank in the middle of the campus. The Indian engineering colleges, the IITs, are being urged that the foundational course for newcomers when they come is to teach them how wonderful Indian science was 2,000, 5,000 years ago. Well, they were great achievements in, in, in Indian science, and they should be celebrated. But, but this push of a particular kind, these are only examples. So what you say is true, absolutely true. And you know, a similar and a related question to what you say is, well, we can blame them, but who caused all this? Who is responsible for all this? Those are also important questions. But I would say, more important than that historical question is how do we get out of the situation today? And, if we, and do we recognize the seriousness of the moment? Do we recognize the seriousness of the moment for Indian democracy, seriousness of the moment for Hinduism, and what will we do about it today? So even those who may have had a role in making India uh, harsh, unfair, unjust, our institutions weak, if they are prepared to make amends, if they're prepared to work with us, why not? So uh, I think you, you I, I'm sure you'll get the drift of what I'm trying to say, that there is a continuity and yet there is a very major change. I think that's a really a nuanced answer. I want to ask you as a historian, part of what is so remarkable about this moment is the attempt to rewrite history. And maybe that's unfair because all history is a process of rewriting. Uh, but in particular, the reclaiming or the attempt to claim uh, Sardar Patel, Lal Badu Shastri, even Ambedkar as being icons now of the Subhash Bose of the uh, the right wing, only Nehru is off limits. So, right? so uh, far. So far. Now, all, I mean, you ask, it doesn't matter whose fault it is, that's because yeah. we know the answer, it's Nehru's yeah. fault, right? But, uh, yeah. but these others. So how do you think, I mean, could you help us as a historian uh, yourself yeah. understand sort of the, your take on the reality of the situation about these other leaders of post-independence India? So when the present regime tries to appropriate, as the word goes, or uh, to praise whether it is uh, Gandhi, Patel, Ambedkar, Subhash Bose, Bhagat Singh. Uh, it's, an, it's an understandable reaction to be unhappy about it, to be angry about it. Uh, but at, at that point, if whenever we have the chance, we have to uh, point out what exactly Gandhi stood for. Are you standing for this? So when Narendra Modi writes this article on Gandhi in the New York Times, there are two words missing in it. Muslim, totally missing. Non-violence, totally missing. So when they talk about Patel, we should point out, do you know what Patel said about the RSS, what Patel said about Savarkar? When they talk about Ambedkar, we can point out, do you know what, what Ambedkar said about Hindu Rashtra? 
that it's a mad idea. So Subhash Bose, all right. You know, the other day, there was this attempt to have a, this statue of Subhash Bose, Savarkar, and Bhagat Singh together. But Subhash Bose, Hindus and Muslims together. That was the strongest passion of his final years. So they will, of course, want to use everyone that they can. They do not believe in consistency or, 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 or the great morality of consistency. They believe in what is effective, what can work for the moment. Each time they do it, we should explain what these people, what Lal Bahadur Shastri stood for. That would be my response. Thank you. I have two more questions, and then I hope there'll be questions on the floor. The first is, if you think uh, of what the response right now is, what do you think our obligation is to talk, to listen, to those whose values uh, or whose speech, whose actions we fundamentally disagree with? When I think of the Mahatma's teachings, it seems that at least one lesson, one interpretation, is that we are obliged to even treat those that we most vehemently disagree with with respect as fellow human beings, that we need to talk and listen. I ask, because there's a debate raging, right, as to sort of, do we, uh, do we engage or do we push away, do we, so how do you want, how should we be thinking about that response? These are fellow Indians, we might disagree with them on all sorts of things. Uh, where do we draw lines? How do we engage? How do we keep conversations going? Great question and not an easy answer, and I think a very, uh, one, uh, another form of your question is this. How do we talk to our relatives who think very differently from us? <laughs> uh, and this is a, a great, great challenge. And I think, um, I, I wish I knew uh, a recipe for this, uh, but I'm sure one secret is to be patient listeners. Another is not to be afraid of expressing our firmest disagreement, but if possible, in, in a courteous manner. So, you know, Gandhi uh, did mobilize large numbers of people, but he was above all a dissenter. Above all a dissenter. Oh, I dis disagree. I disagree. Um, and um, but, but you're right that uh, we, the, as I said, the average Hindu man in the street, woman in the street, is not a bad person, is not a hate-filled person. They're susceptible to all kinds of passions and emotions and sentiments, and they can be swayed um, if the right lead is given. But Yes, whether it, in, what we are saying about India, of course, applies so much to the United States. Uh, and white Americans are not bad people. <laughs> we all know fantastic white Americans who have meant so much to us in our, in our personal lives. Uh, and the same is true of Hindus in, in India. So, uh, if we have in our hearts uh, maximum respect for them, but an absolute uh, willingness to speak the truth no matter how unpalatable it is, um, people, people will come around. Uh, and they're, anyway, but I, I think others may have better answers than I on this one, but this is a very important question. Uh, to which all of us must find creative answers. Thank you. One last question, and then the floor. Uh, you're a biographer of the Mahatma, and so it, I wouldn't be doing my job if I didn't ask this question. It's interesting watching uh, contemporary discussions of his legacy, uh, in particular in Africa, in the continent of Africa now, about attitudes and writings and speeches that can only be described as racist in a particular moment of his life. Uh, I think others would suggest that those views evolved, but nonetheless that the legacy 
is more controversial today than one might have anticipated 30 years ago. There are other questions asked uh, about some of his views on gender, on sex, etc. Uh, as a biographer, not as his grandson, as a biographer, how would you advise that we think about the more complicated man behind sort of the, uh, the incredible legacy that is undisputable, but there's a man at the core of that. What would we, how would we do justice to the full person, as it were? Each person must make her or his independent assessment. That is what Gandhi would want. That everyone study him to the maximum extent possible and make uh, the f clearest, frankest, most candid assessment. But since you mentioned m my bio biographies, I have addressed both these questions, the African question, as well as uh, his chastity experiments, uh, in my books, in a book called The Good Boatman, in, in my biography of Gandhi. I would want anyone interested in my views on it to go to those, those books. But on the Africa question, I will, I will take this chance to make a point. There's no doubt, although I myself would not use the word racist, uh, others are entitled to. Why shouldn't they be free to use it? Gandhi certainly made many offensive remarks in his South African years, in his early years particularly. Uh, and he was prejudiced, he was ignorant. Uh, his passion, his activity was seemed limited to the Indian people of South Africa, did not extend to the Africans of South Africa. That is an undoubted fact. It is also, however, an undoubted fact that in 1908, in Johannesburg, to the YMCA, in May of 1908, he made this a statement when he referred to the Africans, named, naming them. He referred to the Chinese who were also in South Africa at the time. He referred to the Indians. He referred to the coloreds, the mixed race. He referred to the whites. And he said that we must all look forward to a, few, to a commingling of these races and so that all these races together will create a society not dreamed of before. Now, these two scholars in South Africa have written this book called The South African Gandhi, which I've read from. They do not mention this statement at all. It is also part of the record. They do not mention also the fact you know, how many here have heard of Albert Lutuli? No one has. You know, Albert, yes, you have, sir. Albert Lutuli got the Nobel Prize in 1961 or 62 for his fight against apartheid before Archbishop Tutu and Mandela got the Nobel Prizes. Albert Lutuli, in Mandela's language, was a passionate disciple of Mahatma Gandhi. And when Albert Lutuli was in the United States, he spoke about Gandhi's impact on the African leaders of South Africa. Is that, does that find mention in the book by these two? It does not. So there is much in the record uh, which enables us to see that Gandhi was limited, he was wrong, he was flawed. Uh, but there is also much in that record which is pretty impressive. That is an understatement. Uh, uh, we have time for maybe a couple of questions uh, before I want to be respectful of the fact that many of you were expecting to be done at 7. We started a few minutes late, so let's take a couple of questions. If anyone wants to indicate by raising their hand, uh, there's a question over here. Uh, let's start over here first. And we'll take both your questions before we open it up. Okay. Introduce Hi. yourself, please. Hi, Professor Gandhi. My name is Sundar. I was a student at Georgetown. I work at a think tank in DC. Uh, thank you for this lecture and this conversation. It's very enriching for our souls. <laughs> um, I wonder if you would um, help us understand how much do you think civic ownership or civic participation will actually help restore the smaller liberalism, the tolerance of the others? Um, do you know that could actually help chip away, if not completely overturn this 
rise in fascism or Hindu nationalism in India? Like, how much do you think citizens or people just need to come out and say, you know, it's my community or my province or my city, and I'm going to take ownership of it, I think. Fantastic. Absolutely. This is it. You put it much better than I could put it. <laughs> Absolutely. And if we mean our city, it must mean everyone in the city, not just my lot. Uh, you know, the most amazing thing about the United States, of course, the United States, so many failures, the Native Americans, Native Americans, the African American slavery. Yet, 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 let us concede. This nation was supposed to be a nation built on an idea, not built on a bloodline. And independent India also was that idea. That India was not Hindu nation although Hindus might be the majority, it was a nation for all equality, an idea of equality, of mutual respect. But this idea has to take shape in small communities, in small cities. Uh, it has to be actualized over there and over here. But you're absolutely right. So this is, this is the, the way in which, in my opinion, we will make an impact against this rising tide. Thank you. Thank you. Question in the back. Thank you. Um, thank you for your insightful remarks. I'm Arjun. I'm a student here at Georgetown and Professor Irfan Nuruddin student. Um, you spoke, so Gandhiji, of course, obviously, he stood for timeless political values, but he also stood for a very particular independence objective, right? So in the context of what you said about the United States and coalitions with African-Americans, Latinx populations, um, to what extent do you think that's a transnational solidarity based on shared, possibly, Gandhian values? And to what extent do you think it's a very particular set of issue-based coalitions towards particular political objectives, both in the US and in India? And how does this work when the words liberal and conservative mean very different things in the US and in India? Thank you. Before you answer that question, yeah. so maybe we can take one more question from the front. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and the right here in the front row, please. Thank you. Thank you so much for that uh, both insightful and encouraging uh, talk. I have two questions. One, um, we hear the statement of central ministers on television, so it's not something said in private, that in the next two years, I think the deadline is 2022, uh, all Muslims and Christians will be wiped out. It's left uh, unclear whether they'll be exterminated or clubbed to death or whatever favorite method they use. Uh, do you take that seriously? How do you react to that? Number two, uh, looking at the Mahatma, and I been writing about him, I'm going to be writing about him in my new book. I would say that Einstein's great quote about him, that there will be a time when we look back in astonishment that one such as he walked this earth, he really deserves that and even more, because when you see him in the context of what's happening in the world today, he really is absolutely extraordinary. I fear that what we are seeing now, because he's such a center of gravity, He's such a towering figure in the South Asian story, not just India, but the South Asian story, that these continuous assaults on him uh, in the media, effigies being uh, burnt, shot at, ashes being stolen. I just wonder how much impact all this is having on the young so that the next generation may not be as familiar with the story, the Mahatma story, as maybe the older generation is aware of. And will they be able to retain this very inspiring uh, image, the symbol of something that transcends the religions and the cultures of India as one unique man, uh, and how important it is to hold that concept of India together? It'll be a great loss, but I'm just concerned whether this image, this symbolic image of Gandhi, the Superman almost, whether that can survive in this uh, very ugly climate and in the stories you hear about uh, the subtle double speak assaults that are taking place on him. You can take any of those that you wish. Well, thank you for these uh, questions, which also uh, include some valuable comments. Um, just to take yours first, uh, I think that Gandhi would say, and I would endorse it, uh, that 
uh, it does not matter if, if Gandhi is destroyed. But it, it, it does matter if truth is destroyed. It does matter if innocent lives are destroyed. It does matter if equality is destroyed. It does matter if, in, in, if India's constitution is destroyed. If Gandhi's is, is statues are removed, if his, if his image is removed from India's currency, no, no loss. But if we give up the idea of equal protection for all, I mean, that is what we should be worried about. Uh, and so many people innocent people or people wrongly accused uh, lose their reputations, lose their lives. Yes, Gandhi was killed in, on January 30, but in 1947, how many were killed? Muslims were killed, Hindus were killed, Sikhs were killed, brutally. So, uh, I think Gandhi can take care of himself. Uh, Gandhi will take care of himself, his image, but even if his image goes, no matter. But we, we cannot afford uh, to let the other things go without some protest from us. Uh, I absolutely agree with you about the coalitions across the world. Uh, local coalitions based on genuine interaction, integration, fusion if possible. Uh, but to be more specific, you know, one of my longings, I, sometimes I say that I now want to become younger and younger and do work for 20, 30 years, but that won't happen. But I, I long to see more Indian Americans or more Indians study the African American story deeply and get deeply involved in the struggle of the African Americans. It'll be a fantastic thing locally. It'll be a fantastic thing globally. You know, how much India has obtained from Africa, millions of jobs with trade, so much money has been made over the centuries. Uh, what a great privilege it will be for Indians to really become brothers and sisters in a genuine way to the African people. And here in the United States to the African Americans. And when I say that, I, 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 have, I mean the same thing also for the Latinx and, and for all the other groups. For the Chinese who are here, for the Pakistanis who are here, the Bangladeshis who are here. Over there we can't meet one another, here we can meet everybody without any problem. So some of you who have raised these questions, who have expressed these views, I'm, I'm thrilled about that. Uh, I respect all that, and I look forward to some fabulous things happening as a result. Uh, I can't think of a better uh, note on which uh, to end. Uh, thank you. I mean, for those of us who, well, for all of us for whom uh, Gandhi was, uh, is an inspiration uh, to be in your presence, both because of the connection you have to him on a personal level, but also because of the legacy of continuing his work that you have carried out through your illustrious career is a great honor. Uh, thank you all for taking the time this evening to come and join us. Uh, the India Initiative tries to bring uh, speakers uh, 
and cultural events to campus uh, to promote the understanding of India, to create different voices over here. Our next uh, event for, is on November 10th when we have Sangeeta Sivakumar uh, Karnatic Music uh, Concert uh, on campus. Uh, uh, we can't, few things on which they should unite all of us more than music. So I hope you can join us then. And india.georgetown.edu is our website. You can follow all the different programming and events we do. I want to thank the colleagues at Optimum and my colleague Kelsey Harrison, who's done all the work uh, to make sure that th this evening went uh, well. But uh, please join me in thanking Dr. Rajmohan Gandhi. <laughs>